said together, Amen. All right, children, young people, you may go with the staff. God bless you. We do have nursery children's ministry and youth ministry today. All classes in full operation. Beautiful group of children leaving. You know how I know they're a beautiful group of children? Because they look like us. Hallelujah. And we're beautiful people. Amen. Nothing ugly about us in attitude or appearance. We are blessed. You are blessed. So good to have you this morning. All right, for time's sake, you can open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we'll read verses 1 through 9. And in my endeavors to be a uh, more effective pastor, we are shortening the length of the messages. And that's a good thing. Praise God. I've already been teased this morning. Everybody said you'll probably preach shorter because the Vikings are playing the Panthers on TV. <laughs> I'm a big Viking fan. Starts at 1 o'clock. I had somebody offer to buy me a ticket. I turned it down to be here with you. Praise God. This is far more important than what happens in Panther Stadium today. You know, if the Vikings win, praise God. The Vikings lose, praise God. I've got to where that doesn't bother me near like it used to. I used to get tore up and bothered by those kind of things, but I can enjoy a football game without letting the football game irritate me. That's mastering the circumstances. If I'm going to watch something that's going to irritate me, I've learned my lesson. Let not your heart be troubled. I just won't watch it. Just won't watch it. Just turn it off. I was watching a preacher that was irritating me, and the Lord said, and then Teresa said both, turn it off. Don't watch it. It's a good solution. So God's good, and uh, we're thankful today. So we're studying now this word of the Lord that he gave us. You're a joint heir with Christ. So let's take a moment and just remind and remember that we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. That everything in the new covenant is freely given through the person and work of Jesus. We receive it by faith. Our faith has its foundation in God's Word. Faith without foundation is not relevant. I have a rental car in the parking lot because of my trip. And that rental car is a Jeep Patriot. It was designed by someone who intended certain things to function certain ways. And when you're operating that car, there's a gas gauge. And the gas gauge will full, half full, empty. And in the middle, there's a three-quarter and a quarter line. And you know, that gauge was designed to give me information that was necessary to the operation of the vehicle. And this is very important. While I was driving yesterday and, and looking at the gas gauge, the Lord said to me, you know, you can believe that that's full. But it has no foundation in what you believe. Because it's now reading towards E. You can believe that that's full. And if you keep believing that, you're going to end up on the side of the road. Because if you're going to operate this vehicle, you have to learn to operate it by the gauges. You have to learn to go by that gas gauge. And so then I realized that no matter what you believe, it has to be founded on God's Word. My cousin's a commercial airline pilot. He flies a mid-sized jet for American Airlines, and he and I are very close, and we talk often. His name's Mike. And so I fly, and I, I've flown, not extensively, but I've flown a lot over the past 30 years. Been out of the country several times and flown. And one thing that always amazes me that a pilot can, you know, those commercial jets, my cousin's jet will go about 480 miles an hour at its top speed with a full load. And so that's about eight miles a minute. That's flying, that's moving. I mean, that's flying, flying, that's fast. If you're going that fast in a car, you can imagine. They don't make a car that'll go that fast unless you have a jet motor on it. And I asked him, I said, so you're going along at 480 mile an hour and there's a big cloud bank in front of you and you can't fly over it, under it, around it. And you go in there and you can't see. What do you do? Because I'm sure when you're sitting in the cockpit going that fast, the only thing you can see is the clouds party when you're in that. And we've all that have ever flown, you know, if you get in clouds, you know, the clouds go by the wind and you can't see anything. You can't see up or down. And he said, it's easy. You just go by the gauges. 
He said, it doesn't matter if I believe I'm going right or wrong. It ha that has no bearing on it. What matters is what those gauges said. And you have to understand is living by faith is living by God's Word. You know, that's your gas gauge. That's your instruments. Especially when you're in a storm, you have to go by what God said. And you can believe something, but if it's not founded on the instrumentation of God, then it's still invalid and it won't work and it will leave you stranded somewhere. We need to believe what God said. Our faith must be based on God's Word. The only way I can operate in faith is to believe what He said. I don't trust God any more than I trust my Bible. I don't believe God any more than I believe my Bible. I don't have any more time for God than I have for my Bible. It's that simple. You must base it on what he said. Again, it doesn't matter how much I believe my gas gauge is full. If it says empty and it's functioning properly, then the gas gauge is empty and eventually I'll run out of gas and be on the side of the road. So a lot of people have tried to believe things that weren't necessarily founded on God's Word and they've ended up in the ditch on the side of the road in the journey with God. If we're going to walk by faith, we must learn to walk by God's Word. We walk by faith and not by sight. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Not by going to church, although thank you for being here. And not by tithing. Thank you for tithing. Finances are always necessary. And faith doesn't come by praying, and thank God we know how to pray, but we must learn there's only one venue of strong faith, and that's God's Word. So just because somebody believes something doesn't make it so. You know, I got caught up in some, some silly teaching back in 1988, and there was a teaching that went through the body that said, Jesus will return in 1988. The rapture must happen in 1988. I got caught up in that, and I believed it. And I believed it. And I really did believe it. I really did in my heart. I even preached on the Sunday before Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets that year in 1988. I did preach and I told the people, I said, I don't think we'll be here next Sunday. Now, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny then. I was, very, I was being very serious. And there were people in the church. Now, some of the older people knew better. They just figured, well, he's young and kind of dumb and green, so... You know, he'll figure this out. But the younger people believe me, and we all got caught up in that. And then the next Sunday when you have to come to church and explain that, you remember what Gomer Powell used to say? Surprise, surprise. We're still here. And then if you go back, now listen, that's, what are we now? 29 years past that. 29 years. Good Lord. Good Lord, how could you have ever got caught up in something that silly? See, I believed it, but there were some things that they were preaching that were contrary to the Word of God. And because what they preached was contrary to the Word of God, and I believed it, He didn't come just because I believed it. Do you hear that? He didn't come in 1988 just because I believed it. Now, I did get on my knees and say, Lord, please help me. I want the truth. He did encourage me. He did help me. He did come to me personally. But as far as his coming, my faith didn't produce that. So you have to understand when you're walking with God, you want to be very prayerful and considerate to make sure what you believe is based on what he said. So we're studying this word of the Lord, which is Romans 8, 17. That said, if we are children of God, we are heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is written. So that's my gauge. No matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, I remain 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, an heir of God and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. That never changes because it is written. My faith must be based on what he said, not what I just believe apart from his word. I must believe what he said. So from that, we're studying the blessing and how the blessing translates through Abraham. And now we're on the financial part of our covenant. We're calling this series covenant finances and when we teach finances we end up not talking a lot about money because money's really not the issue money is a tool you need money to operate you can't do anything in the earth without money money's a tool money's always a test and money's always a thermometer of your heart there are a lot of people that will quit when things get hard financially and give up there are others that will quit when things get too easy financially. 
We had a couple long ago at the old building, and when they couldn't rub two nickels together and we had to help them pay their light bill, they were at every service. They loved, they served, they gave. We prayed, they believed, they went out, they got jobs, promotions, blessing, and then as they became rich and, and were increased greatly, then soon we didn't see them on Wednesday anymore. Then we didn't see them on Sunday night. We used to have Sunday night service. Then we didn't see them every other Sunday. Pretty soon they were out of the house of the Lord and they had bought the big house and the two cars and got the expensive, uh, you know, purebreded dog, all that stuff and all that's wonderful, but it took them out of church. When they didn't have anything, they were there trusting God. See, you'd be better off there trusting God than you would to have all that money in the big house and go over there not trusting God and getting caught up in your own carnality. That's not wisdom. You always want to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Always seek first His righteousness and the kingdom of God. And so, to have the big house, to have all that, wonderful, thank God for His prosperity and blessing, but not at the expense of me being faithful to God Operating God's way. I'm going to operate God's way whether I have a little or a lot. I'm not going to start giving when I get a lot. I'm going to give today. You know, a lot of people are waiting for their ship to come in. Sweetheart, you didn't send a ship out. There's no ship coming. You have an inheritance that's freely given by God. And then you're, you have a right to operate in harvest. And preachers have never distinguished between inheritance and harvest. Inheritance is what's been freely given you that you had nothing to do with but receive it. Then you can operate in it. Harvest is when you sow seed and reap from that. Which one's scriptural? They both are. Which one's biblical? They both are. Which one does God want you to have? Both. Both harvest and inheritance. They're both scriptural. And if you don't make a clear line between harvest and inheritance, especially financially, then you're always going to be caught up in the gimmicks and the tricks of trying to get people to give and trying to work the system and, you know, all of those things. You'll give this $2,000. Well, for example, back in 1998, it was preached in the body of Christ that that was the year of Jubilee because natural Israel became a, a nation in 1948 and in 1990 it was 50 years. And so that if you'll send this money in, then all your debts will be canceled because one of the characteristics of the year of Jubilee is debt cancellation. And so there were thousands of people in the church that sent that $2,000 offering in and they didn't get their debts canceled. Because that's a gimmick, that's a scam. And I, I respected a couple of the men who got involved in that. It's a scam. Because the truth is, if you really want to talk about debt cancellation, you've got to start with the cross. And I listened for months. Back then I would listen to that stuff. And there was never one time that I heard a mention of the debt that was canceled at the cross. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us or made us debtors was nailed to the tree. Not one time did I hear that. And then if you really want to go on and preach debt cancellation, we need to cancel the debt we owe each other. Forgive one another. And then if you want to take it into the financial arena, the way to preach debt cancellation is that if somebody owes you money, forgive them and let it go. And see, they were preaching that if you'd sow them the money, the man that had the note for your house would just forgive you. <laughs> A lot of foolishness. So I want to avoid that at all costs. I want no part of that. I want no operation of that. I want to operate my finances and this church by how God teaches we should. Because the new covenant has instruction in it. So thus far in our study, we've noted that number one, we need to preach the gospel to the poor. And the poor is in every dimension. And then number two, God gave us a prophetic word last week concerning the house and how to build the ministry. Go up to the mountain, bring wood, build my house, and I will take pleasure in it. We looked at the prophet's message, the people's mistake, the plan for ministry, and then the promised manifestation. God said, I'll take pleasure in it. I'll be glorified. Favor will come. And we had prophesied this morning that favor is here. Favor is now. Favor is coming. And I believe you said favor like never before. A deeper, fuller, richer expression and experience of God's favor. And we are of faith, and we are blessed with faithful Abraham. And although he had no economy, he was a wandering nomad in a wilderness without substance or supply. He was richly blessed in everything he did because God was his source and supply. 
Now that's what I want to operate in, the blessing of Abraham. Galatians 3.14, now remember the gauge illustration? Galatians 3.14 said the blessing of Abraham comes on the Gentiles through faith and we receive the promise of the Spirit. So I want to walk in the blessing of Abraham no matter where I am, what I'm doing, operating financially or spiritually or mentally or physically or socially or emotionally or any other realm of my life. I want to operate in the blessing of Abraham and I want that blessing to operate in me. Proverbs 10.22, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. He adds no sorrow with it. That's the one I want. The blessing of the garden. Be blessed. And he says, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, replenish, have dominion. That should be working in my life now. That blessing's been restored. That blessing is Jesus. He's the blessing of life. There God commanded the blessing, even life evermore in Psalms 133, verse 3. So we want to learn to operate God's way. We've heard this prophetic message. If we'll take the message of the cross and the message of Jesus and what he did, what that means to us, and we'll let God build the house through redemption's blood and redemption's blessing, then God will come and favor this place, favor this house, be glorified in it, and we'll become an amazing revelation to the earth that the light of God and the glory of God will go out of this place, the river will flow out of this place and touch broken, hurting, crying, dying, signed humanity. That's what we're believing for. And the only way that's ever going to happen is if we learn to do things God's way and not our way. Shocking revelation, my way won't work in the kingdom. Shocking revelation, your way won't work in the kingdom. So this morning, we're going to call this the provision. The provision. So let's read in 2 Corinthians 8. And here Paul is addressing Corinth. And they have made a pledge of finances to help the poor believers in Jerusalem. They have made a pledge to send an offering and to make up an offering to send down to Jerusalem and they have not followed through on their pledge. They have failed to honor what they told Paul they would do. And so now he's writing to them and he deals with this thought that they have made promise, they have given their word and not kept their word up to this point. So from that perspective, the Spirit of God is going to show us masterfully here some things that we can learn. I'm going to deal with verse 9, but notice 2 Corinthians 8, 1. Moreover, brethren, writing to the church, we do you to wit. Now, in modern English, that don't make any sense. So we translate that. We want you to know. We want you to understand of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So the subject here is really not finance, it's grace. When he starts this chapter, he's really not talking about money. He didn't say, we want you to know what big givers they are or what they did with their tithe and offering, but we want you to know grace. So what's the thought here is what? It's grace. How then in a great trial of affliction, so they being persecuted and being attacked for their faith, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty. Now notice that they had great joy but deep poverty. Now those two things don't go together. I know myself when I've had deep poverty, I didn't have much joy. Can we be real this morning? I know deep poverty never made me joyful. But here he says they had great trial and the abundance of their joy. So if you're in a great trial, what does James say? Count it all joy. Now, most people don't do that, but God said, when you're in a trial, count it all joy. I've counted it woe, misery, pain, suffering, woe is me, but he says, count it all joy. And their deep poverty, so they had some poverty that was entrenched. But from that place of being in deep poverty, they abounded to the riches of their liberality. So he's really not just talking about their giving, he's talking about grace working in the heart. You see, grace will make you liberal. But grace will also make you conservative. I'm not speaking politically, but grace will make you conservative. There some, see, the grace of God will appear teaching you to deny ungodliness. There are some things that I'm very conservative about. And then there's some places where I'm very liberal to the riches of their liberality. So he's showing you a contrast. These people that he speaks of, grace was working, and although they had affliction and trial, yet from the deep place of their trial, they still had joy, and they still kept giving. Now that's a real fruit of Christianity. And he says, for to their power, their witness, or their honor, or their integrity, I'm bearing record. I'm telling you what they did, yea, beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Praying us with much entreaty we would receive the gift. Now, Paul says, they came and started begging us. The literal translation here says, they came begging us to please take the offering. And I have preached in foreign countries. I, I preached in one foreign country. And it didn't look like the people had a lot, but their offering was astounding. 
And I tried to give the pastor half of that back before I left. I said, listen, if you'll just cover my expenses, this other money, I don't feel justified. He said, pastor, you robbed me of my blessing. Take the seed. Take what we give you. God will take care of us. And with reluctance, I put that money in my wallet because I really didn't feel right about taking it. Because I saw how they lived and what they had. But those people were joyful in their giving. They were willing of themselves. They prayed with much entreaty. Now notice how this changed. In Paul's day, they were saying, please, preacher, take the money. In our day, the preacher said, please give the money. And a preacher begging for money is nauseating. To stand up here and take 30 minutes in a service and talk to you about how if you don't give, we're not going on, that's ridiculous. If God's with us, we're going on. At some point, you have to live by what He said. We're going on. And so we never take more than four or five minutes with an offering. It's not necessary. God will touch your heart, your people of faithfulness. You love God, you love this house, you give. That's what I speak over you all the time. You have a generous heart, you have a generous spirit. You're givers, you're tithers, you obey God. I believe that all the time for you. So he said, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And here, here's the key of how grace operated. This they did. They asked us to receive the gift. They said, take this and minister to those that are hurting. Take this and bless them. They gave themselves to the Lord. Grace causes you to give yourself to the Lord. First thing you need to be concerned about your giving is give yourself to the Lord. It's not about your money first. Give yourself to the Lord. Sow your life an offering to the Lord. John 3, 16. God so loved the world, He gave His Son. 1 John 3, 16. Brethren, if He so loved us, we ought also to love one another and lay our lives down for the brethren. My life is a seed. I give it to you, Lord. Now sow it wherever you will. Now what's the subject here? Grace. Grace brings me to a place of heart where I can say, Lord... Now, I'm not going to give my life because I'm unwise. I don't know where to give it or how to give it. I've watched preachers give their life to build a church and then the church walk out on them. I've seen that happen. That's unwise. I don't even know where to sow my own life. But Lord, I give my life to you as seed. Sow it where you will. And he sows it in prayer. He sows it in open door. He sowed it in Alabama this week. And when he sows it, then I never get spent out. When he sows it, I don't get burnt out or tired out. And I reap a harvest of his design, of his destiny, of his direction. And it always blesses me they gave themselves to the Lord that's very important don't miss that they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God so you learn three things here giving first is give yourself to the Lord second is give yourself to the ministry now I have a pastor his name's Pastor Sears I give myself to pastor every Sunday morning I'll call him and bless him through the week. As I started out to Birmingham Thursday, I called him and said, please, I need you to pray for this trip. I'd called him two weeks ago and asked him to sow seed and pray over it. And I called him Thursday, please cover me. I give myself, now, pastor, if you need me, you call pastor, whatever you need. If you need me to pray for you, if you need me to help you in any way. When he was in the hospital, I called him. I said, listen, you want me to come sit by your bed and read your healing scriptures? I'll be right there. Whatever you need, that's what I'll do. They gave themselves to the ministry. That's very important that you make yourself available to serve. I need you to pray for me. I need you to help me. I need you to help me build open door. I need you to hold my hands up. I need your help. And I promise you, I'm not going to try and use you. I'm not going to take your life and, and pour it out the way I see fit because that's just as bad as what I would do with mine. I don't know any better, but God will put you in the right place. God will help you if you'll learn to do that. And then they gave themselves to the will of God, which was ministering to people. So I say it this way. They gave themselves to the master to the ministry and to meet the needs of people and that's what grace does grace causes you to give your life to the master Jesus to the ministry to bless and build the house and then to meet the needs of the people which is harvest in so much that we desired Titus that as he had begun so he would finish in you the same same grace see he's still talking about grace he's just talking about the grace and how it influenced the people at Macedonia so if I stop and ask you now you speak of grace and this is a grace church and we say we're not under law how is grace influencing your life how is grace impacting you what has grace done for you what change is grace really making because if it's not making an impact if it's not influencing if it's not changing if it's not bringing you to that place of this then it might not be the grace that God wants you to operate in 
There is a grace that's turned into lasciviousness, Jude said. There are evil men crept in and aware that turn grace to lasciviousness and they become spots in your feast. They become clouds without water and trees without fruit and waves of the sea bringing up their shame. There is that aspect of those who turn grace into lasciviousness. But here he says, listen, this is the grace. Wherefore, as you abound in everything. So let me stop and encourage you. God wants you to abound in everything. God wants you to abound in your faith, in the fruitfulness of the Spirit, in the gifts of the Spirit, in healing, in life. God wants you to abound in everything. God wants you to abound in everything. In faith, in utterance. That praying in the Spirit, in utterance from the Spirit. Knowledge and in all diligence. Man, be diligent. And in your love to us, see, look, have vision that you abound in this grace also. See, this, this part of his letter is, is just absolutely saturated with grace. Grace worked in Macedonia. They gave, they were struggling, but they gave willingly and they have their joy intact. They have joy and they're giving willingly. Now, Titus, call the people and tell them. And he's writing through Titus this letter and he says, Now tell the people this same grace is available to you to abound in your blessing because Corinth was not under affliction and Corinth had a lot of money. It was a very affluent place. Now, just, just as a note, Oftentimes, bigger churches with great resources are far less in their giving than smaller churches with less resources. That's true. I've experienced that. And go to a church that will run 14, 1,500 people, and they'll give you an offering. And, and it's a good offering because of, of where we are, and the money I make is a good offering. But when you go back and you compare that to the number of people that are there, you go to a church this size and they'll give you almost three-fourths of that offering or sometimes as much as. It's just amazing to me. It's amazing to me. When I walked out of Birmingham, how that group of people blessed me. Those Church of Christ people are givers, man. They're givers. I mean, about every one of them in there were just putting, they're pulling out money left and right. I was shocked. The first night I said, that's more than I prayed for to ask for the whole thing. Giving. A little group of people in a hotel room. And one of the men that goes to that church was telling me about that Church of Christ. The other Sunday, they asked for a makeup Sunday because they, they were behind. And that little church, that small church, gave $108,000 in one offering. One offering. Those people brought in $108,000. I was like, wow, what a heart. What a heart. What giving. So we have to learn. I know of a church in a, in a city, and we're going to leave the city nameless, but this is, this is the church. They're a Pentecostal church, and they've got an auditorium that seat 800 people. They've got a choir loft. Their building's paid for. They've got a full gymnasium. They're in a part of town where they can minister to people left, right, and all around. And that church sits there, and what happens is, because of where it is, you've got a bunch of suburbanites that drive to that church on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. They open it up for a few hours, and then they do their thing. They close it. They go home, and that gym sits there, and that church sits there, and it runs about 100 people. And I'm thinking to myself, if with that kind of facility, and they have more people drive by their church in a day than we have drive by this church in a month. And I'm thinking to myself, it's all paid for. 800 seat auditorium. Classrooms, I mean classrooms for all ages on a multiplied level. And then on top of that, a full gymnasium. I mean a full gymnasium where you could get kids in there. You could go in there and get kids in there and play ball with them and then get them all sweaty and then set them down and give them a hot dog and a drink and preach the gospel to them. You could give to people. You could use that. And yet they always, it's in and out. And so I went around knocking on doors. I was at that church and, and I went over and knocked on a few doors to ask people. And I said, well, you know, would you come to the church? And you know what they said to me? He said, well, we never even know that church is there. They come in on Sunday and leave on Sunday. We don't even know who goes there. Even the next door neighbors of the church. Never, I never seen so much given and so little done with it as I have that church. That reminds me that was in the 80s. But again and again, I think about that church that had so much and did so little. And then I think about a church like Open Door. And we don't have a lot to do with sometimes. But we give it. We sow it. We've sown all over the world. And I want to do something with what I've got. And that's what Macedonia did. Praise God. And I'm believing the day will come when we can bring the kids into a gym. I'm believing that. You know, every day I walk out of here, I prophesy these buildings are already there. Prophesy these buildings are paid for. Prophesy this 12 acres is developed. Prophesy favor on this land. Moments of favor. God could change this. But as He changes this, He needs to change us. Now notice what He said. 
I speak not by commandment. He's saying, listen, this is not some law I'm putting on you, but by the occasion of the forwardness of others, meaning by, by I've watched the other church at Macedonia and their liberality and their love to prove the sincerity of your love. And the truth is, is that the sincerity of our love, the blessing and the giving of our love and heart has a lot to do with how we operate in this grace. And the grace does affect us in our giving. And this is our text this morning. I've only got a few moments left. You know the grace. What are we back to? Grace. Grace in Macedonia. Grace working. Abound in this grace. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Did you read that? It's staggering. Let's read it again. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Now, Sandra, can you put that on the board for me in the Amplified Translation, please? Do we have it? Let's read it from the Amplified Translation. All right. For you are becoming progressively acquainted with and recognizing more strongly and clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what are we talking about? Grace here. His kindness. Grace is generosity. His undeserved favor and spiritual blessing. Praise God. Undeserved favor, spiritual blessing. How He blessed me in every dimension of my life. His gracious generosity, His undeserved favor and spiritual blessing. In that though He was so very rich, yet for my sake, your sake, our sake, He became so very poor in order that through His poverty or by His poverty, you might become enriched and abundantly supplied. Now that is well done and well written. So, very quickly... Notice this, the message of grace. God wants you to embrace and receive the message of grace. I'm thankful for the grace of God. I'm thankful that this is not based on what I do. It's based on what He did. I'm thankful it's not based on my merit, but His. It's not based on my ability, but His. This word of grace has changed my life. This word of grace has revolutionized me. And so God wants you to embrace this and receive it. God's grace is freely given to you. God's grace is freely given to every man. God's grace is freely offered to every man through what Jesus did. It's freely given, but He wants you to receive it. Now notice what that says. He wants you to know it, become more acquainted with it progressively and deeper and more clearly acquainted with it. God is a God of grace and His grace is on you today. His grace is on you. His grace is working for you. His grace is working in you. His grace is changing you. His grace is ministering to you. His grace is multiplying you. His grace is at work. But you have to receive this. You know it, now receive it. Thank you. Romans 5 verse 17 said, They which receive the abundance of grace. And I, on a continual basis, Lord, I receive the abundance of grace. And here's the difference. The law demands something from you. The law demands that you love God with all your heart. The law demands that you not take His name in vain. The law demands things of you. But grace supplies something to you. Grace gives something to you. Grace supplies, not demand. Grace supplies righteousness. It supplies peace. It supplies blessing. It supplies favor. It's like the Niagara Falls. It just keeps coming. And if you'll just receive this grace, become acquainted with it and know it, it will will impact, it will influence and change your life and put you far more in the way of agreement with God. Then you'll notice this. There's the earth walk and the mystery of God in the flesh. Now he was very rich and so most people preach this as eternity. And was he rich in eternity? Totally, absolutely, completely. But he was rich in his earth walk and this is where the myths and the mysteries come in. And Let me just show you a couple real quick. You know, every church play I've ever seen, where are the wise men when they get there? Where are they? Where are they? They're at the what? You said it right. What is it? They're at the manger. Did you know that's not true? Matthew chapter 2, they never made it to the manger. Jesus was already in a house. We're without excuse. We wonder why people relegate the Christmas story to the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. is because we don't even get it right. Any worldly person that reads the Bible says, Well, those wise men never made it to the manger. Matthew chapter 2, the wise men came in a house. See, there was no room for him at the inn. And there's a great message there. See, we preach there's no room at the inn. There was no room for him. There's a lot of places where there's no room for him. 
Are you listening? There's a lot of places where there's no room for Him. There are a lot of hearts where there's no room for Him. There's a lot of places they'll say, you could talk about God all you want to, but you mentioned Jesus, you're fired. Back to my cousin Mike for a second. My cousin Mike is an avid Baptist boy. I mean, he, go, he for vacation, my cousin Mike went to Jerusalem and passed out tracts on the street. Did that for seven days. That's one week of his vacation last year. Going down there witnessing the Jews and passing out tracts. Now, that's a dedicated witness. Good old Baptist boy. Loves Jesus. Wants people to get saved. He's nearly gotten fired three times for talking to people about Jesus. They finally called him in. American called him in and said, Listen, Mike, you're a great pilot. You've been with us 30 years. You're a Czech pilot. You, you can do all these things. Preach on your own time. Fly the plane when you're working for us. But he'll go through his plane before people get on there. Put a track in every seat. Pray over every person getting on his plane. That if they don't know Jesus, they need Jesus. Praise God. There's a lot of places there's no room for him. So there was no room for him at the end. But you know, then tradition teaches us that Joseph and Mary were poor. After all, they were riding a donkey. But you've got to realize a donkey in that day was a Cadillac in our day. A donkey in that day was a Cadillac in our day. A donkey was a good thing. And then, when the wise men got there, they opened up their treasury, so they were in a house. See, Joseph didn't just keep him in a barn. He was born in a barn because there was no room for him at the end. You see that? And not because Joseph couldn't afford a room. Why would you go ask about a room if you couldn't afford it? Then he was in the house. Well, where'd they get a house from? And then if you'll read the story, when those wise men got there, they opened up their treasuries to him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They funded him at his birth. They funded him at his birth. I heard all my life growing up in church, Jesus was homeless. I heard all my life growing up in church, and I saw the little pictures that they put up on the flannel graphs. That really tells you how old I am, praise God. Flannel graphs. We're going back a day or two to get to flannel graphs. And Jesus was a funny looking little guy with a one size fits all sheet with a sheep under his arm going around trying to get people to believe in him. Now that is a picture of a poor Jesus. But Jesus was not like that at all. I heard this in church all my life. When Jesus came and lived among us, he was just like us. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Seriously? You know, you worry if the light bill's not paid. Jesus walks on the water. You stay up all night if the wind howls. Jesus gets up and says, peace be still. And the sea is quiet. Somebody dies. We take a bowl of potato salad over there and say, I'm sorry. Jesus goes and raises them from the dead. He's nothing like us in his earth walk. The greatest phenomenon to ever dawn human history was this man called Jesus. For three and a half years, he showed you the Father. He rocked this world. He cast out devils, healed the sick, cleansed the leper, discharged the debtor. Ain't never been anything like Jesus. And so in John chapter 1, they said to Jesus, Master, where do you dwell? What did he say? And tradition will teach you that Jesus said, Well, now you know the foxes have a hole. And the birds have a nest, but I don't have anywhere to lay my head. So now we got a homeless Jesus. Got a homeless Jesus. You know what he said in John 1 to those men that asked where he lived? He said, Come and see. Because... All tradition will teach you Joseph, his earthly father, died, passed away. We don't know why or how or when. He just passed away. And by right of inheritance, the house became the house of the firstborn. That was Jesus' house, and he gave it to John and to Mary in his death. Jesus had a house. Now, how about this one? Jesus was poor. Jesus had a treasure. Now, see, you don't need a treasure if all you got is $2. You don't need a treasure. If the offering today is two dollars, ain't no need for nobody to count that. I can do that myself, and it won't take long. One, two. Won't need no treasure today. Won't need a financial sheet. Won't need a report. Won't need a ledger. Won't need to put that in the computer for anybody's tax record if that's what it is. But there was a bag. If you study, Jesus had people that gave to him all the time. And then on top of that, Judas was a thief. 
And he was stealing out of the bag. And you know, you really got to have some money coming in when somebody's stealing to make it. And Jesus never rebuked him for his stealing. He's not condoning Judas's thievery. He's telling you that if you trust the Father, nobody can steal from you. You'll make it God's supplies everywhere Jesus went. He paid his way. He paid the way of the 12 in their families, of the 70 in their families. And Jesus constantly was blessed everywhere he went. Just imagine, Father, I thank you. And the loaves and the fishes multiplied. You can't see it this morning, but in one hand, he had a wheat field. In the other hand, he had an ocean of fish. And he just kept giving, and he just kept giving. Endless supply connected to the Father. There was never anything missing. When he was in the earth, he's the richest man in the earth there's ever been in this earth. Nobody ever lived like him. Nobody ever walked like him. Nobody ever talked like him. Oh, again and again, when you walk through the Gospels, you see the miraculous Jesus. You see the miracle-working Jesus. You see him, Peter, lest we offend them, go and the first fish you find, the money will be in his mouth. He's a God of supply. He's a God of the supernatural. Jesus was not like us. He was very rich in the earth walk. Everything he did was blessed. Everything he did prospered. Everything he did flowed like a river. He was not like us in his earth walk. He came to show us the Father. He came to show us the supply. He came to reveal God to us. That's why he came. Look at it. Though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor. Now notice, he was rich. When you study the Gospels in the light of what they really say, please, you know, and I understand we're all trying to do the right thing, but when you see the wise men at the manger, just know that somebody didn't read Matthew chapter 2. And the world makes fun of us, and we can't even get the story right in church. We are without excuse. We have a Bible. Do you remember what I started with? You got a gauge. And if the Bible said the wise men came in the house, then you got to have them in the house. You don't need them in a manger. Somebody said, well, that don't make no difference. It does make a difference. It does matter. God said the wise men came to the house. It does make a difference. You can't just sloppily read it and act like you could just take it or, greet or leave it. or you, you can't do it. See, it just makes a mess. That's no difference in you believing that the car is full when it's empty. Same thing. Huh? Amen? Come on. Praise God. All right, five more minutes. Five more minutes, and we'll draw no close. So, and I'll, I'll have to stop with this. We may come back here next week, God willing. I don't know, but we'll stop with this. So then, now we come to this redemption and the mercy of the great exchange. So when did Jesus become poor? When did he become poor? When did he enter poverty? That you through his poverty. When, when did he become poor? Now, I want you to notice in your Bible, put your eyes on it, that you through his. Now, notice his poverty. His, so he took it. His poverty. He took this. It becomes his. You have to be willing to let your poverty go from you to Calvary. Same thing you have to do with your sin. You have to let your sin go from you to Calvary. You have to let fear go from you to Calvary. Sickness from you to Calvary. You have to let it become his and not yours. This is not yours anymore. He took it. So when he goes in the Garden of Gethsemane and bows his knees in the gritty gravel of the garden, he bows and humbly bows himself and he says, not my will, but thine be done. He took the cup and drank the cup. And in drinking the cup three times, Jesus fully identified with us in our fallen, weak state. And this is a big controversy right now. People are teaching that Jesus was never punished by the Father. God didn't do that to Jesus. And they'll ask this question. Bible teachers will say this. What kind of father would punish his son? Especially when his son had done no wrong. And the answer is, he did not do that to Jesus. The answer is, he did it to who we used to be because Jesus identified with us. And if we miss that, we miss the whole purpose of Calvary because what we were and what we had become through what Adam did was not acceptable to God and God identified Jesus with us and Jesus became poor. So on that cross, Jesus was made to be sin. He's poor in my sin. He's poor in my fear. He's poor, separated from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's poor in my sickness. Himself took our infirmities, bare our sickness. He's poor, and people hated him, spitting on him. He's poor in my lack under the curse, hunger, thirst, nakedness, and one of all things. On the cross, Jesus physically was hungry. Jesus was physically thirsty. Jesus physically was naked, and Jesus had no physical need met. 
You have to understand this. Jesus perfectly died our death. It was orchestrated. It was ordained from the heart of God, from the foundation of the world. The lamb died. There was a lamb before there was a man. There was a lamb before there was sin. There was a lamb before there was sickness. There was a lamb before there was poverty. There was a lamb before there was a child dying of starvation. There was a lamb. God's one all-inclusive, all-encompassing answer is a lamb that hung on a tree and one day and died the death and the curse was put on him and suffering put on him and darkness put on him. Jesus bore it all. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, Jesus took everything that I was. So that, why did he do that? So that, what does it say? So that you may, through his poverty, be enriched or made rich. Enriched. Now I'm going to have to stop with this and I'll close with this. Please notice the word and words mean something. What if I said to you, you know what? I rode my dog to the store and got my groceries and my car was barking in the garage last night. What would you say? You'd say, hmm. Pastor's <laughs> Okay, the car's not barking in the garage and I'm not riding my dog to the grocery store. You know Why? Because you don't ride a dog to the grocery store and cars don't bark. See, words mean something. And the way you arrange them means something. That you threw his poverty. So why does the translation lend itself through? Through is a preposition. Which means from beginning to end. When did his poverty start? Garden of Gethsemane. The moment the cup touched his lip. Here's the glorious news. When did his poverty end? Because I got a word for you. Jesus ain't poor no more. Hallelujah. Come on, I need a little bit more response. Let me say it again. I know that's not good English. I could talk better. Jesus, for those of you that are educated, isn't poor anymore. For those of you that are like me, he ain't poor no more. Hallelujah. That's what I care. He ain't poor no more. Oh, God raised him from the dead. And when he did, God gave him the heavens, the earth, the promise, and the throne. And when we look at Jesus today, he is seated in sovereign, majestic, omnipotent, reigning, ruling, unchallenged, unquestioned, unparalleled, unprecedented glory. He is rich beyond measure. All things are his. He is Lord of the creation. He is Lord of all. And he is forever ruling and reigning. He's rich today. And by the way, you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. That's yours. On the cross, he became the poorest of men. And in the throne, he's the richest man that ever has been or ever will be. Which one is he? He's both. So James says this. Stand with me so I'll know it's time to close. If you don't, I'm going to keep preaching. There's a good flow of revelation here. You got to remind me. I promised Mr. Wayne I was going to work on this. And when I first told him, he said, I believe that one when I see it. <laughs> I'm doing better, Mr. Wayne. Come on, I'm, I'm working on it. Praise God. I'm conscious of it anyway. Well, but at least you'll never accuse me. When pastor comes in, he's ready to preach. He's full of it. Praise God. You accuse me of being full. I'm full of it. Praise God. I'm full of the gospel. Amen. Two men, James said, if two men come in your assembly, one is poor and one is rich. And he says, you say to the rich man, sit thou here, and to the poor man, stand in the back. Now notice, you'll tolerate the poor man, but you won't celebrate the poor man. And so we took that to mean like if we have a man come in here and he walks in and he's got, you know, a tailor-made Armani suit on. And, you know, it's obvious he's got diamonds and he's got money. We're going to set him up here, but if we have somebody come in uh, that lives... In a part of town we wouldn't appreciate and all that stuff. And maybe he's an alcoholic or a drunkard. We'd stand him in the back. And that, that's way, way, way secondary to what James is talking about. The rich man is Jesus. And we should take Jesus and set him right here. And say, Lord Jesus, you are, you are Lord of this assembly. You are, the, you are the pastor of this assembly. And we bow to you. And anything you want to do, this is your house. You are Lord of it. You own it. You operate it. It is yours. You are King Jesus. And we, everyone, bow to your magnificent royalty. We bow to Jesus. But we should also bring the poor man, which is Jesus on the cross, and set him right there. 
And we should humbly bow before the poor Jesus and say, I thank you for what you did on the cross. I thank you for bleeding for me, suffering for me, dying for me. And although I know you're king, I know what it took to bring me to the place where I could sit with you. You can't disdain this part of the gospel. And Paul says he was made poor that through his poverty you might be made rich. I'm going to pray for you to have supernatural supply this week. I'm going to pray for you to have supernatural supply. Supernatural supply. So let's agree now. And I want the ministers of the house and those of you that are elders are going to pray. Come stand. Stand with me and get ready to pray for people. And at the end of our service, if you have any need that you want these to pray for, to pray with you about, we are here to serve you and love you. If you have a need, a concern, a fear, you're hurting in your body. If you have any need, please come forward and let them pray. Don't leave without having your needs prayed over. It's very important. So, Father, now, thank you. And even though there wasn't time to finish this word this morning, thank you for your grace. We know the grace, Lord, to become intimately more acquainted with, progressively more understand this grace of God, that you've given us what grace, what a, no wonder the songwriter says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, amazing grace. Thank you. Lord, forgive us for how we've butchered your story in places. And Lord, let us go by your word. I pray, Father, we would see how powerful Jesus was in the earth walk. We would see what revelation, what power that he dominated death and devils and disease. And he dominated discouragement and doubt. There was nowhere you could put Jesus that he wasn't a masterful king reigning in every circumstance. But then how we need to see Jesus entered in and drank that cup and became poor with our pot and weak with our weakness and suffered with our suffering and took our death and I made a vow long ago when I saw that in James I would never celebrate the rich man without celebrating the poor man and you know if we get that right in church then it won't matter if somebody comes in and they're wealthy or somebody comes in and they're poor we'll treat them both the same we'll treat both with dignity honor and respect and love you know what that will do if we understand that revelation? That will deliver us. A young man and an old man can sit together on the front row and it won't make any difference. A rich man, a poor man, a white man, a black man, it won't make any difference because we realize the rich man, poor man set the precedent. We receive everybody on the grounds of who Jesus is and what he's done. That's how we accept people. And to do less than that is to have respect to persons. And James said, if you do that, you miss the mark. So, Father, right now, thank you. We just acknowledge what Jesus did. We acknowledge what happened. And, Lord, to the best of our understanding, we embrace grace today. We receive it. We receive it. We embrace it. And I'm praying right now, Lord, for the young people, especially the younger people here that are age 30 and under. I pray that they would just have supernatural expressions of grace this week. You're going to show them, Lord, your favor, your blessing. It's just coming in ways that, Lord, they're going to be astounded. And for the rest of us, Lord, that are just a little past 30, we receive abundant grace. Lord, I'm recognizing it more and more every day that you're blessing me, your grace is on me, your favor's on me. And you're empowering me to walk in grace and power and truth. And Lord, you're making me a giver. I give myself to you. Lord, I give myself to serve Pastor Sears, give myself to bless people wherever I go. And you sow my life wherever you choose to sow it, however you choose to pour it out. My life is yours. Take it, use it for your glory. Now bless the people. Bless the people, Lord, in Jesus' name. And as we dismiss this morning, I'm just going to speak the blessing over you. And then if you have a need, come forward. If not, then you can consider yourselves dismissed. And walk in this, walk in it. But listen to the blessing. Don't just take these words for granted. Don't take what I'm about to say for granted. I'm not just quoting Scripture here. God said to Moses to tell Aaron, why did he do that? Because Moses represents the law. The law can never bless you. The law can only bless you if. If you do this, and if you do that, and if. He said, Moses, tell Aaron. Why can Aaron bless the people? Why? Because he was a priest operating out of a sacrifice. Hallelujah. He said, tell the people and bless them with this blessing. Now speak it over you. Receive it now. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. Lift up His countenance upon you. And the Lord give you peace. 
This is the blessing of Abraham. It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. It's the blessing of the garden. And it's the blessing that's on your life. His name is Jesus. So walk in the blessing. Thank God for the blessing. Live the blessing. And then everywhere you go, be the blessing and share the blessing in Jesus' name. The altar's open and you can consider yourselves dismissed in the name of the Lord. God bless you.